Atlantropa. The quest to find an unlimited source of energy has intrigued humanity for centuries, and one of the most ambitious ideas to obtain it was devised by German architect Hermann Sergel in 1928. Atlantropa was a gargantuan undertaking that promised inexhaustible energy and abundant raw materials. However, the endeavor was doomed to fail. As populations grew and natural resources were consumed in more significant amounts over the 20th century, the industrialized world called for innovations in transportation and electricity networks. Thus came Hermann Sergel's proposition in the late 1920s, Atlantropa, a technological utopia considered a visionary political reform. Sergel's idea featured a giant dam which would become the world's largest hydroelectric facility and cross the Strait of Gibraltar. A plant this massive could provide energy for half the continent's electrical needs. Furthermore, the gate would control the Mediterranean's main water supply. It was also planned that the evaporation out of the facility would cause the sea level to drop about 200 meters, creating new stretches of land along the coast. Ideally, this scenario would connect Europe and Africa by land, merging the two continents into a single entity. The new terrains would also provide usable land for agriculture, as well as infrastructure and extended territory for entire cities. However, the project was not feasible then, and neither was it during the Nazi era or the post-war period. And political reasons were decisive in its fate. Environmental concerns were not taken seriously during discussions at the time, and if the project had been carried out, it would have caused the complete destruction of the Mediterranean due to the excessive salinization of the water. Still, nothing came of it, as the beginning of a new chapter in human history was brewing, the Atomic Era. Project Plowshare At the peak of the Atomic Age, the US government explored several ways to peacefully utilize nuclear energy. Then, in June of 1957, the Atomic Energy Commission established the Plowshare Program led by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, or LLNL. Its objective was to develop new technologies by using nuclear weapons for civil and industrial projects, but it was precisely the public opposition that ultimately prevented it from happening. The term plowshare came from biblical origins, taken from Isaiah 2.4, quote, they will beat their swords into plowshares. First brought up by President Dwight D. Eisenhower in his Atoms for Peace speech in 1953, the idea of using explosions for non-military purposes focused on the possibilities of creating harbors and canals, and even stimulating natural gas reservoirs. After the Soviets broke the International Nuclear Test Moratorium in August of 1961, the LLNL launched their first test on December 10th. Gnome, a multi-purpose experiment, sought to explore the feasibility of using a deep explosion on a dry seabed to produce isotopes. Then, in July of 1962, Civil engineering applications were tested in the second and largest plowshare experiment, the Sedan event, to create a sea-level canal in Central America. But in the following years, it was concluded that the Panama Canal would not exceed capacity for several decades. Other projects that came up throughout the decade proposed new ways to produce heavy isotopes and open research areas in nuclear physics, medicine, and energy sources. On the other hand, the Atomic Energy Commission encouraged private industries to explore the commercial purpose of nuclear explosions, such as stimulating natural gas production. Project Gas Buggy eventually increased gas production, but it was determined that the quality of the gas was less than desirable. Plowshare's last experiment brought the endeavor to a close in 1973. Ultimately, environmental concerns and public opposition to anything nuclear officially terminated the program in 1977. Failing to consider social, political and ecological consequences, Plowshare did the opposite of improving national security. As social scientist Benjamin Sovacall put it, quote, public resentment and opposition can stop projects in their tracks. Project Mohole During the infamous space race, the world's two superpowers were striving to be the first to explore what lay beyond the atmosphere. But an even more mysterious enigma stood out, 
Earth itself. The same year that Sputnik was launched, a group of quirky scientists from the American Miscellaneous Society resolved to explore one of our planet's deepest secrets, the boundary between the Earth's crust and the mantle. Buried deep below the Earth's crust, the Mohorovicic or Moho discontinuity is a zone where density shifts dramatically. Scientists identified this layer from a map of the Earth's core that several seismologists put together in the early 20th century. By studying earthquakes and the energy they release around the world, researchers sketch the inside of the Earth and the materials that comprise each layer. At a scientific conference in 1957, the informal American Miscellaneous Society explored the possibility of studying such an exciting corner of the Earth. Oceanographer Walter Munk and geologist Harry Hess suggested drilling down and bringing back a sample from the Moho boundary. Project Mohole was then born over a breakfast meeting in La Jolla, California. On average, the Earth's crust is 22 miles thick, but at the bottom of the ocean, it narrows to four miles. Hence, it was easier to drill underwater, but the endeavor was not simple or cheap. The National Science Foundation eventually funded the team on the basis that, as scientist Gordon Lill put it, quote, the Russians were doing a lot of work, and we probably ought to be doing it too. New technologies were developed in the early 1960s to carry out such a gargantuan project, including methods to hold ships steady while in the middle of the ocean, to lower segments of pipe down through strong currents, and to drill through miles of crust and retrieve cores of rocks and mud. The scientists were able to get sediment mud from a few hundred feet below the ocean floor in 1961 before attempting to go deeper. But the project was brought down by bureaucracy before they could try it, and funding ran out. Years later, scientist Willard Boscombe wrote the book A Hole in the Bottom of the Sea, the story of the Mohole Project, which read, quote, The project sounded so simple and logical at a breakfast meeting on a sunny patio. Germania. Among Adolf Hitler's most extravagant plans was constructing a suitable city that would be the capital of the Thousand Year Reich. Welthauptstadt Germania was conceived by the Fuhrer himself and supported by his favorite architect, Albert Speer, as the world capital. Both were determined to build it by 1950, once the Nazi Empire reached all the corners of the globe. A massive scale model of the Dream City was fashioned in 1937, and entire sections of Berlin were cleared. It's also believed that its construction sites may have also initiated the Holocaust. Speer had impressed Hitler with his work, and became the so-called General Building Inspector of the Reich Capital. Nazi architecture was distinguished for its austere reinterpretations of classical buildings, albeit designed to intimidate, and thus conceived with exaggerated proportions. Hitler's vision was to build the grandest city ever. He visualized a boulevard of splendors, showcasing Europe's most significant masterpieces, but sized up along a road over four miles long. The inherent narrative would describe Nazi Germany's superiority to both civilians and visitors. A triumphal arc specially created to dwarf the Parisian Arc de Triomphe would mark the starting point on the south end, but the Nazi version would be six times the size of the original. Then, on the other end, at the north, a parade ground would frame an imposing Führer's palace, the Reich Chancellery, and an absurdly massive Grand Hall. The Führer preferred sheer size to elegance. Though inspired by the sublime structures of the Pantheon and St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, the Grand Hall would be the largest enclosed space in the world, spreading across 99,000 square meters and 300 meters high. It would be the focal point of the city and a place of Nazi cult. Thousands of Jews, prisoners of war, gypsies, homosexuals, and beggars were then worked past exhaustion in brickworks, thus commencing the Holocaust. However, as the war raged on, Hitler's plans were halted, and only a handful of buildings were built. Project Pluto. The arms race escalated after the Soviet Union conducted its first atomic test in 1949, ending the American monopoly on nuclear power. When the competition kicked into high gear, both superpowers set about to create new delivery systems for thermonuclear weapons, marking the beginning of Project Pluto. The U.S. Air Force attempted to develop a weapon known as the Supersonic Low-Altitude Missile, or SLAM. 
Estimates at the time noted that the missile could likely fly 113,000 miles, or even more, before running out of fuel, equal to circling the equator over four times. As the weapon glided in the air, its unshielded nuclear reactor would pour radiation onto the ground, resulting in one of three means of destruction. The slam could also drop 16 hydrogen bombs, and after unloading its lethal cargo, detonate its own warhead against one last target. However, the final strike would happen weeks after the missile was launched. The weapon could potentially affect anyone underneath it, making it impossible for SLAM to fly over friendly territory or even launch from U.S. soil. In itself, Project Pluto was as lethal a measure as the entire mutually assured destruction doctrine. Its dangerous potential eventually doomed the project. In addition to the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles and the new Global Strike payload bombers, the fact that SLAM would destroy anything or anyone on its way limited its application in Soviet territory, as ICBMs could easily reach their targets in the Soviet Union. It was simply too powerful. Besides, there was always a chance that the Soviets would try to develop a similar weapon, and the program was finally cancelled by mid-1964. Thank you for watching our video. Please let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to all our Dark Documentaries channels for more epic stories and curious facts from history.